Well, buenos dias, bonjour. Uh, good in Morgan. So, o pani suhach. How are you today? I just doing a couple, I guess, my bogus ass attempts at speaking a foreign language. Saying hello to all you listeners all around the world. This is Jim the Keys, bartender, coming to you from a nice, cool, crisp key Largo today. It's after Easter, the first show after Easter, and I think I'm a little relaxed. The, the, the traffic's still good down here. We still have people, but we don't have a preponderance of it, which, you know, we were very fortunate down here. I understand a lot of the listeners and friends that are in the service industry have been going through a lot. Or not going through enough when it comes to, when I say not going through, not having enough business or not working at all. Because some in our listening audience have been going through 25, 50% occupancy. We're in Florida, we're at 100%. And we have been, I guess, the, the central, especially South Florida, has been the central part for travel in the United States for people that still wanted to travel and they came down here which once again I'm very I feel fortunate for I realized the pandemic and we we had to try to use safe measures health hygiene I guess we'd call it and during this season we had uh, we went through a lot we had a lot of people come in and when they came, yes, this past weekend, I had someone say, I want a typical, a younger couple came in, I want a typical Keys drink. And that was like a rum runner or a pina colada or a frozen margarita. Margarita. So I was I was going, well, I guess a Keys drink would be something islandy and fruity. So uh, fruity, I mean, in being fruit-based. And... The one, I came, what did I do? The watermelon martini, the orange crush martini, things like that. But yesterday, I had someone ask me to make a coconut martini. And I just went, okay. You know, I just took some vanilla vodka and regular vodka because I want to have too much vanilla in it. And used some Coco Lopez to kind of tint the taste of the martini to coconut, and they put a little coconut shavings on top, and they seem to be happy with that. It's amazing what people will put in their mouths if they think it's part of the local thing. Hey, what's your cocktail menu like? What can I get for you? And I go, like, I don't, I'll make any of you. If you could tell me a little information. Some people aren't ready. They just want to see a list of things that they can pick from. They want to see a list of eight drinks. And they could pick one of them. I said, well, you know, let's have a brief, especially this time of year when it slows down a bit. I can go and say, well, what do you, you heard this before. What do you drink when you're not drinking? That's me all the time now. But I just say, if you're going to have something that's not, what's something you drink for fun, for the taste that doesn't have alcohol on it? And then I can go from there. If it's grape juice, if it's apple juice, if it's, Anything, a ju- something from the juicer. Like, no one drinks pomegranate. Well, I guess you got pomegranate now, recently, with some of the health things. They, the pomegranate martini. Everyone comes in for a pomegranate. And for some reason, every place I worked, we, we've we never really featured a pomegranate martini. I made one from scratch one time, but I didn't want to talk about that. Not that it's traumatic. It sounds like I was abused by the pomegranate. It's just a pain in the ass to get out the seeds and stuff like that. Now, when the traffic slows down down here, we start seeing the locals more often. Or maybe they have more access to the areas that get taken up, like the bar areas and things like that. And you get to talk to them. But I know a lot of lay low when it's busy, especially since COVID. To reduce their exposure, and but there was another. There's a couple that came in. They're they're younger than I am, so I guess they're in their forties, early forties. The the woman's in the late thirties, 
and we're just hanging out. And I'm going to title this episode The Oversharer. Because I do overshare. I realize that. But this guy was sitting at the bar with his wife and a friend. And for some reason, he's a nice guy. Great guy. Wasn't being mean to his wife. But he just seemed to blurt out about all the, the women he used to date at the same time when he before he met his wife. Talking about He mentioned something about dating multiple women at the same time. And what that did was bring back memories of my single life. And I was prompted, and he goes, you know, he just, what do you, you know, something, the topic came up, he's talking about it, and I go, well, I've had a lot of experience with that when I was single, and I found it very convoluted, cumbersome, confusing to date more than two women at the same time. And he looked at me, and he says, I'm only talking about two. And he goes, oh, okay. And he says, well, well what's your experience? With I say, well, I dated more than two women at the same time. That's, I mean, I've dated two women at the same time multiple times. But the most difficult times I've ever had is whenever two she just seems to be my ceiling. I go three or more, I think I had. A, I'm not bragging. This isn't a bragging thing. This is just one of these things where you didn't get into particular a particular relationship with someone. So you're not like exclusively dating someone. So I was in my 20s and 30s, early 30s, and I was a couple people at the same, couple women at the same time. And I told them, I, and then, and then <laughs> they got me into talking, and I just go, well, there was a point I was seeing two married women and a single woman. That seemed to be one because I said, obviously, I looked at them. I'm being clinical. <laughs> about my description. I said, well, with the single ones, and this is before cell phones, you you, you got a call at home. That's it. And if you didn't get a call at home, it wasn't on your answer machine. You didn't have to respond to it. You mean you could respond to it, but they, they didn't expect, especially married women, didn't expect phone calls back, except maybe at work. So... I just went, I told him that, and this guy, as soon as I started talking about it, I said, oh, yeah, the confusion and all this stuff and the names. And I, I looked at it, I said, wait, there was a time I was dating three and two other women had the same first name, so that was easy. And they're just looking at me with the mouth open. He says, like, he, it's as if I was saying, dude, you're giving away secrets. And I said, I'm not giving away secrets. I'm just telling you my experience. You know, looking at, I got these things where I answer questions, the people that they didn't ask, because they're looking at me like shocked, and I go, well, it's not like the secret. I said, women do that too. And then I opined, what was my, my opine was, hey, yeah, and one thing, I don't like this idea, just the person who is dating the married person being called the homewrecker. That's bullshit. It's as if the person who is married is the innocent and the other person. I'm just because the other person liked them. It doesn't mean if they're seeking a relationship with a person that's married, I, I really never understood that. I always thought if they couldn't really commit to that, maybe they shouldn't have gotten married. And it's out. it kept me from being married for a little while because how frequently I saw married people not worrying about the the vow so much. And that was me as a younger guy. I mean, I don't want to put it there. It, another thing we used to say, you hear this from even guys older than me, they used to say, I used to run around with, run around with. Well, when you, that's code. When you say you ran around with someone, that if, if you're talking about running around with a gang, and that, but if you're talking about a guy said, I ran around with her, that means he fucked her. Yeah, that's what it what it meant. Running around, God, which, you know, it was a nice way to say it. You know, in some of the neighborhoods I, I was from in Philadelphia, the guys would say, oh yeah, I used to fuck her. Like, that's a horrible way to say that. 
and I I want to say I used to see them. I went out with them. We we dated for a while. I think that's the polite way of putting it. But the more I said it, the more this guy kind of slinked in his seat. He's like he felt really uncomfortable with it. I said, "Hey, this is when you were single." I explained this to my current I when I got married, I was pretty I mean the first time I got married I was I was I was good I was a good guy I, but my, as a married and this, this time actually as you get older it's easier I don't understand how I guess it's one of these things if you've never had a wild period it kind of sucks when you're you get older and you look back and say wow I never screwed around well I screwed around plenty when I was younger so I don't feel the need I I I understand what the psychology is of when you're with someone for a while and then all of a sudden you think, well, they don't really appreciate me much. This person I just met seems to really appreciate me. And I said, it's just the excitement of being seen differently through someone else's eyes. Because eventually, the person you're running around with will look at you through the same tired eyes as anyone else. So if you don't have anything new to offer, if you don't have any depth of soul, like the person goes, wow, I really care about this person because this person is a really good person and they care about me. If they don't, if that's not their first instinct, they won't look for other things they find endearing about that person that they see. The more things you pile on, meaning like you look at the person and go, wow, you're quite the asshole, aren't you? You're a bigot. You know, if that if you have a problem with a bigot, you know, some people don't have I can't see it at people being truly in love when you have a hateful person and one hateful person involved in that. Because there's a lot of narcissism involved with someone that's truly hateful. Stay away from that. You know, of any side, of any ill, the left or the right. Watch out. Because that strong feeling can be turned against you. And you would you might say, hey Jim, you got feelings too, but I don't necessarily hold harbage. I don't believe anybody is unsalvageable, uh, person wise. So yeah, you can have made you can have made mistakes in the past. There's horrible mistakes and there's minor mistakes. But uh, like I said, when a topic starts in a bar you got to be careful where it goes especially with oversharing and I'm not oversharing because I'm under the influence I'm oversharing because I think oh well why not why not be truthful about it I don't want to be a hypocrite especially when someone comes in and says oh I drank too much the other day I, I, I was here and I thought you weren't putting enough booze in the drink and then later on I felt I felt it and I said, well, if you make a drink really good, you don't really notice. And the person goes, I'm sorry that I felt that way. And I said, well, how did you feel the next day? Well, I knew I had too much. Uh, I was sitting at a table and I, I I didn't realize it until I got home. And I said, well, you know, that's all. That's well and good. It happens. And they know, if they know I'm not drinking, they think I'm looking at them like they're out of control. And I said, why would you think, and whenever if they ever mention, why would you think that I, you you should be ashamed of that in front of me? I was so bad at drinking that I can't drink anymore. So why would I ever judge you? <laughs> How? What room do I have to judge? And just like when I didn't, when a person's a cheater, or someone loses their temper, or someone does anything dishonest. It's it really gets back to that old adage in the New Testament to say, "Let he without the or that person without sin cast the first stone." I'm not a religious person, but I'm also keenly aware that I got to be really careful about what I think about myself and how I think about other people. So if I started accusing someone in my mind of something that I've done before, I've, I'm gone. 
Yeah, I'm not going. I'm not going to go on a rager or anything like that. I'm just saying I could end up going down that road where it's just total asshole. I'm partially an asshole. I know that. That's why I don't automatically like an, the, there's the asshole, the douchebag, the dickhead. Right? I'm an asshole. The douchebag and the dickheads, they're they're meaner. Douchebag douchebag's really mean. Dick dickhead. Yeah. Shithead. Yeah, they're, they're all they're all the same. Asshole doesn't necessarily have the intent to do that. They have they're careless in their I guess their utterances and their sometimes their behavior. And I, real, I realize that. And I think it's important. And it's not negative. When you say that, I'm not beating myself up. I always say I'm a work in progress. It's always nice to say that. Being a work in progress. It's work. When you say your work, meaning you're almost like a work of art. And you're not done. If you're done, if you put that locker over like they used to do, and we're going to talk about phot- uh, photography because, once again, it, we are in the most fortu- unfortunate time in history, most fortunate time in history, all at the same time. But if you view yourself as being done, then it's almost game over for you, Right? There's no room for that. How would anybody even be around you if you well, I'm perfect the way I am? See, there's a balance. You you can love yourself and love the way you are, but still realize that you, there's room for improvement. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, is there anybody out there? you got to really fake it to think that you're an exceptional human being and that you have nothing you can do to improve. Well, uh, I'm not trying to be better by thinking that, but just think that. Think of yourself as a work in progress, a beautiful work in progress, and you'll be fine. Get into photography. You know, tourism season was over, and if you think about it, think of all the photographs you take nowadays with phone. Recently, let me turn mine on. Uh, Alexa, turn on the frame. Uh this past Christmas, one of the objects I bought, I bought a wireless frame for my wife because I said, you know what? That's what you need for your photos. You need a photo so you can load it on and you can load on hundreds of photos onto your frame. And it just, you know, you got like a 10, 12 inch frame that is in an area, key area in your house you get to see all the time and just does a little slideshow. Like a hundred photos, two hundred photos. This way, you don't have to be one of those places where you just have a hundred photos all over the place. You have to just have tabletops and walls dedicated to photos. Well, because of the ease of photography right now, no one is more than three seconds away from ready to record an event for posterity. It was four or five years ago, I was in the supermarket with my family, and I, it's when I was doing the delivery service before online apps kind of really spread out through this part of the world, in the Keys at least, and I was doing vacation uh, rental shopping for people. I wasn't doing it for people at home that just wanted to you know, pay $10 to get their food. I was charging 25% and, and mileage and all that stuff for doing that and I figure I was going to expand you know I was right at the edge you know right prior to the the cyber revolution of online apps but I was in there I was looking at blueberries for somebody and I picked up the blueberries and I wasn't really paying attention I was looking at my phone for the phone uh, the shopping list and I kind of fumbled the, the blueberries and they fell in my hand. And then I did that thing um, where I tried to stop it from hitting the floor by putting my foot out. 
really nimble that way, almost like a soccer player, because I, can't, I think it's the bartender in me. If you drop a glass, you don't try to kick it up in the air. You try to put your foot underneath it, right? When you drop a glass, you know, an empty glass, you don't want to get your foot cut up, but you kind of block it before it hits the floor so it doesn't break. And I'm 50%. I get like a 50% of that. But with blueberries, not a good idea because I kind of kick the blueberries up in the air. And this guy standing there, he's laughing. And he's, oh, my God, oh, my God. And he starts fumbling for his camera. And I'm like, fucking dude, it's already over. And then I'm looking at him, he's laughing. And I go, if you take that picture, I'm looking at him like, I'm going to kick your ass. And then he looks at me and he goes, oh, my God, uh, I thought you were my friend. And I'm like, wait, um, first of all, I thought he may have knew me and then, he thought I was his friend, and no, it wasn't that case. He thought he was his friend he was shopping with. He goes, oh, you look like my friend, and uh, that's why I was going to do that. And they go, oh, okay. Well, I mean, I don't think it's nice with your friends when you're trying to document their mishaps. But photography has gotten so convenient. And I was thinking about the development of it like it was such a big deal. It was such a big deal. And I was thinking that it was really start right before the Civil War. It was 1839 to be exact when they started fixing images on that stuff like that. But the concept of photography goes back to a couple hundred years uh, before the common era. 400 years in, in China, they understood about optics and things like that where these, it's called a uh, camera obscura. And it's a box that would let an image through and it would project the image on the far wall of a box or onto another surface. And that would go on through the Middle Ages. They did it, and artists used to artists. They used to do tracings on canvas, projected on canvas images. And if we're looking at things like the eclipse of the sun, I guess then they knew you're not supposed to look at the sun. You know, a lot of people nowadays don't know you shouldn't look at the sun. But that's the, that's not what this show's about today. So they had the camera. They just didn't have the material to fix the image on. And that's what they, 18, they started in 1700s getting temporary image capture and things like that. And it wasn't until 1839 where someone treated uh, glass panels. I think it was then. And you know, pho- photosensitive chemicals. And then... You know, through the Civil War and things like that, you had, you know, portraits taken with the flash powder and things like that. It wasn't until the 1930s where most uh, 20s and 30s where you could purchase, a consumer could purchase it and take pictures, but you still had to be an adept to develop the photos. And all through up until the 90s, when you took pictures and things like that, you had to get them developed. So as you further go back, the more a big of event the picture was taken. You get the whole family together, get the pictures. They used to take pictures of dead people. That was, you know, the only way, I guess a dead person is a good one to take a picture of because they don't move. And in the beginning, the older the photograph, the longer the person had to stand still. So the ultimate model for somebody is, hey, well, who are you going to get not to move when you go? There's a dead person over there. We'll take a picture of that dead person. No, but you think wealthy people used to have, you know, they used to have portrait, uh, portraits, you know, you got to bring a painter in and do, a, you know, they, no one, had, you know, with a painting, it was always the interpretation of the artist. If you really wanted a good painting, you'd say, well, this person painted them. That doesn't look anything like so-and-so. They probably said they wanted to be. They didn't want to be painted the way they looked. They, the original artists were kind of caricatures, and then when photography came around, that was who they were. And there wasn't any smiling thing. It kept a neutral expression because you only had one photo, so you didn't want to have one person smiling and the rest of the people like somber. And then I guess people started smiling in the mid twentieth century for photos. You'll see it all the time. Well, you see it with some of the old Western ones, but then again, they were probably drinking a lot too. But it was always an event to have your picture taken. And it was very few people had their pictures taken at unawares. 
Unless you never came across a f- camera before and there's something and said, oh, we're going to take a picture and you stand here and we're going to stand here. People say, what? You know, you can see these primitive tribes that were being in contact with some scientists in late 1800s and things like that, early 1900s. go, what the hell is this thing they're doing? Why are they lining up? And they just stand there and they snap a picture. They think it's some kind of ceremony and stuff like that. And then they get upset thinking their soul was being stolen or whatever it was. But it was always an event. It always was a big deal when you get your picture taken. You just didn't do that. You didn't have a lot of pictures floating around. To this day, I was born in 1963. I only have like one or two baby photos. Now, there could have been a lot of photos taken, um, took, taken, taken, whatever. But you got to take the photo, you got to get it developed, and then you got to put it someplace where people are going to access it. Right? And the further you go back, the less photos people had of each other. You know, obviously, the people with access to the resources that have, you know, handheld cameras and stuff like that. Like the Kennedys had pictures taken of them all the time, wealthy people. They had their lives documented. Anybody born post 1980, think about it, 70s, 80s, there was tons of photo. Then you had, the, you know, the instant camera and all that stuff. People... Photos all over the place. Then you got to store the photo. Now, digital photos. Who would ever, in the old days when you were taking pictures with just the film, who would take 20 photos of someone into one position and waste it all? I mean, there was no selfies, you know, Instagram, something. I guess there were people just taking an instamatic camera and flashing a picture and stuff, but they didn't know what it looked like. It was interesting. You would you'd get like one or two photos. That's it because you had to pay it, and it was like fifty cents a photo. It was expensive then to get your photos developed, and you couldn't just have lots of them, right? And then if you wanted to get think of it, if you wanted to get a compromising photo of someone, I guess it's the eight, yeah, it's nineteen thirties. They started doing the spy cameras and shit like that. But prior to that, you wouldn't have like, you don't see compromising photos of anybody. You, you, you see, in, you start seeing in 1930s, 1940s, 50s, 60s, compromising photos, secret photos and things like that. But you don't see a picture of Jefferson Davis and General Be- Beauregard in a bathtub together. I mean, if someone showed up with one of the cameras with the flash thing, they just, all you have to do is move, move your head a little. Because then you would be a blur and you go, well, that's not me. You can't tell that's me. There's no, there was no refining it. You don't see pictures of Abraham Lincoln with a fan dancer. I mean, a lot of them. Think about it. There was a, they can say, oh, it didn't happen. There's no picture of it. Nowadays, not only can they get a picture of the whole event, they get a moving picture of the whole event. They get it in detail. They get it from different angles. They can also do a deep fake. We take photos from some other, and so we went way past that thing where you didn't have to worry about compromising photos to do that. And another one, how ubiquitous the phone is now. No one takes. You're not supposed to take your cell phone out when you're in a gentleman's club. I imagine you aren't. I haven't been into them a lot recently. Nope, but. I remember in the 80s and 90s, there was a signs outside one of my local strip clubs. And I mentioned this on previous podcasts that it said no flash photography, no photography. no. I mean, it said no flash photography. I mean, I can imagine what kind of reception you get if you walk into a, a neighborhood nudie club, strip club in Philadelphia back in the 80s and 90s and you had a camera around your neck. You would get a severe beating, and that camera would be destroyed. I mean, why would you? I guess maybe the the notice on there was just for. I don't know why the notice was on there. I mean, who? How stupid would you have to be to fucking bring a camera into a place like that? Hmm. You know, but like, you're, everyone's only three seconds away from a photo right now. It's horrible, horrible. And wonderful at the same time. Because everything's documented. Every trip to Poland we go to, there's 200, 200, 300 uh, photos. 
How many people do that? We used to, uh, at one point, I had uh, to do a talk on my trip to Poland to my Rotary Club. And I thought, oh, well, I'll make it funny. And you know what? It, it really was boring. It, it, I mean, I was ready to off myself in that instance when that's, it was, I was hooked up to a projector. I was hooked up my, my phone and I was going through the of the places we visited in Poland. And I just realized it's automatically when you have a projector show, uh, it is, unless you make it interesting, which you can make it interesting. I always think you can insert, I, I, I think I can insert graphs to uh, make a slideshow interesting. But the, it would be the topics on the graphs. Like, it would say, this is the, the topics of the food on the airlines and stuff like that. They would be a bar graph, and Lufthansa, Delta, you know, Air Canada. And, and then I could put a pie graph of the flight attendants and the, the presentation, the way they looked, the amount of alcohol they had available, all different things. And said, this is the patience my, my wife had for me while I was talking on the plane. And I would show that would be, I could do, uh, you know, a line graph for that, show the spikes and downward, like when we got eight hours into the flight. Yeah, trust me. I know it doesn't sound funny, but there's all, depending on the topics you put on there, you know, the topics of, you can put on it, things found through the security checkpoint when you go through their immigration. You know, when I was walking in with my my meteor mic, it looks like a big silver tablet. I can say what they normally expect is in your bag. And this guy thought, I think he was, thought he was looking at a butt plug when it was actually a microphone. Well, there you go. No excitement for you, Mr. Border Guard. So, my father, speaking of that, has been posting a ton of pictures of him as a kid. He was in Ohio. So they had reason to take photos of him. I was number two. I was number two in my family. Actually, number four. I mean, number two in the family. Four, if you count my stepsister. But it, in my family, it was number two. And I had, I think, probably the least amount of baby pictures taken of me. I was a disagreeable baby. The couple pictures they have of me went as, you know, in my two and under, I was relatively, they didn't really ever catch me in action. And supposedly in action, I was horrifying. So that may be the reason why they didn't take pictures. And I'm not hurt by that. I mean, at least they don't have me doing anything compromising. And I don't know what it would be like if they had those kind of cameras and cell phone uh, video cameras. Now, I mean, being able to record a cell, uh, video and things like that, it was horrible. Just look at that movie, Borat, the first Borat. And he shows up with his, gets on the camper with the college kids and all the stupid shit they said. Well, I'll tell you something. I don't think I said some, the, you know, the nasty stuff they talked about. But I said some pretty stupid stuff before when I was drinking. And I am so happy that wasn't recorded. I think I even did a podcast once, which I had to delete because it was at the end I couldn't even turn off my recording. That's that's somewhat embarrassing. Well, we reached the end of the show and we talked about photographs and how my dad posted the photographs. I should have said that. That was nice. I didn't see as many photos of my grandfather and grandmother when they were young or younger. Much younger than I am now. And uh, 1941. Wow. But 1941 was only 22 years before I was born. Yeah, the, and the end of World War II was 18 years 
prior to my birth. That's that's interesting. The changes in culture and the way that we have photos and the way where we we keep them they're so so different now, so foreign. If you try to show someone this is what I'm looking at the the frame where they have all the different pictures playing um, going in, it's it's changed so much. But they kind of envision. I'm sure they envisioned that back then, but they never really make context as thinking how you're going to record everything should you record everything that's the main thing you got to be careful about what you record uh if you are in key largo when you stop by the catch restaurant we're at mile marker 102 oceanside open every day of the week for lunch and dinner monday through friday they have happy hour 3 30 6 30 with great food and drink uh specials and if you catch your catch, bring it in. We'll cook it up for you. And there's many a non-seafood dishes for people that want to, you know, try, don't want to eat seafood. And that's a lot of you out there. I realize that. And uh, what else? Uh, that's pretty much for there. If you do come to the catch, please tell them that Jim, the Keys bartender, sent you. And if you have any requests or comments, send me a message at jimandkeysbartender.com. Once again, I'd like to thank all my listeners. Boy, you had a big uptick in Tennessee. Thanks, Sean. I guess you share with your friends and family. I hope you're feeling better, and I hope uh, I guess you're in Myrtle Beach now if you're on vacation. I hope you and your family are doing well. And all you listeners, wherever you are coming from, thanks again. This is Jim the Keys Bartender signing out. Let's get that music going. If it works here, I'm going to play it. Talk to you later.